the opportunity to be here. Uh, I was asked to go over some of the research we've done looking at other causes, um, other causes of POTS-like syndromes. It's important to realize that POTS is not an illness per se, but it's an abnormal clinical state. And there are many ways to get there. So in cardiology, there's a condition called congestive heart failure, which is a failure of the heart to meet the needs, the needs of the body. It's, an, it's not a disease, it's a clini abnormal clinical state, and there are about 50 different ways to get to congestive heart failure. And POTS, I believe, is the same way. There's a whole bunch of ways to get to the same place. Now, just to uh, review something quickly for you, we can divide the human nervous system down a number of different ways. One way is divided into central and peripheral. Peripheral can be divided into somatic, the parts you have control over, autonomic, the parts you don't. In the case of just blood pressure regulation, this is a feedback system, much as we build it within our own computers and all today. Uh, information um, regarding what your pressure is is provided by a series of what are called unmyelinated C fibers or mechanoreceptors. These fibers respond to stretch and generate a chloride ion flux that generates electrical activity that is then fed into the brain. The brain processes that information and sends instructions out to the rest of the body to raise this, lower that, change this, change that. And then there's a feedback loop that says, okay, you've done it, stop. So there's input, processing, output, feedback. You can break the cycle anywhere along there, that route, and get the same problem. You know, it doesn't work, but the levels at which you break it, and that's a very simplistic thing, because it's actually, in actuality, is an extremely complex system with multiple layers of feedback. So for example, if a computer network is not working right, it's usually not, there's not just one problem it could be, but hundreds of different problems. And if you look at somebody who works like as a Cisco programs person, there are hundreds if not thousands of different ways that a Cisco program or, or network in a computer system can malfunction, and it's the job of finding it. So kind of like trying to give you a, a lecture over what could be causing these is kind of like this, you know, it would take several days to go over it. And indeed, POTS may be a consequence of all of these things. I'm just gonna focus on a very few of them that we've looked at. Um, as uh, one of the things that we see a lot more is with, uh, with some of the newer chemotherapeutic agents is people who are being treated for cancer being referred to us with increasing levels. I'm not gonna talk about this today, but we have a large now, very, very large Parkinson's center because we have this um, very prominent Parkinson's expert that joined our center, and we see more and more people with that as well. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about first is um, research that we done, did collaboratively with the Cleveland Clinic on mitochondrial diseases. We began to see patients that were very ill um, and kept getting worse. They oftentimes had extreme muscle weakness in addition to their autonomic problems. And um, I started to become worried that they had something greater going on. And um, mitochondria, just for um, your background, are these little things inside cells. They're actually probably were bacteria that lived independently of eukaryotic cells and they became incorporated within our cells you know, millions upon millions of years ago, and they produce uh, power. They're the power plants for the cells. They produce energy for your cell, and they do so through very complex biochemical mechanisms. Uh, this gives you an, a little uh, electron micrograph. This doesn't, I'm sorry, this doesn't project as well as I'd hoped, but that little arrow there, and I don't have a pointer, uh, points at some of the mitochondria. And so there are a whole host of different problems where out of a 30 or 40 step chemical process, one enzyme will be missing or just deficient, just one. Okay, so, and it could be any one of those 40. And then the cell doesn't work right. Um, this is a, um, uh, what you get in some of these, they're called dense body formations. They're basically breakdowns and degenerations of the mitochondria. Now, we partnered with Dr. Bruce Cohen at the Cleveland Clinic, who at the time was at the Cleveland Clinic, now he's at Akron Children's Hospital, who was the world's leading authority on mitochondrial disorders. And we did a collaborative study, uh, which was the first time, even though people had reported there was a high incidence of autonomic problems in mitochondrial patients, we actually published the first paper. This was a paper that came out. At first, uh, we looked just at six patients. All of these people, this, at the time, it had to be diagnosed by, by biopsy, so we would have to take a muscle biopsy. It was sent to Cleveland Clinic where they had to do uh, these very thin slice and electron micrographic 
uh, samples. They had to stain for each of these individual enzymes. So they had to do a series of maybe 20 or 30 different staining procedures and then quantify the amount of it. It's a very laborious, time-consuming technique. And there's only a couple of places in the country that really do it well. And we are only two hours away from Cleveland, so it was, it was a nice collaborative study. These people, um, this is an example of one of the muscle biopsies in our, in our series. These red clumps there, and again, I, I apologize, this doesn't project as well, are basically dead mitochondria. So the red clumps you see there are basically mitochondria that are dysfunctional. So our original paper, we looked at six patients that had been sent to us. Um, they all had fairly severe problems with autonomic problems. All, virtually all of them had been suffering from syncope. Uh, they all had positive tilts. Um, we were, able, we were treating them with different pharmacotherapies, but we wondered that something else was going on because one of the most prominent symptoms they had was muscle weakness and fatigue, which was progressive in nature. Um, also, one of the other things they had is extreme shortness of breath because in some of these syndromes, the muscle weakness extends to the diaphragm and they are unable to, to generate a bellows activity. In other words, how do you breathe? You contract your diaphragm, you pull it down, it creates negative pressure and air comes in. And uh, several of these patients were unable to do that well and had marked decreases in their inspiratory volume. Um, so what we showed uh, in these people is that um, uh, many, that this group, this small group at first, we found were suffering from these mitochondrial disorders. Now, why is that important? Well, you can try to replace what they're missing. Okay, some of them are missing alpha lipoic acid. Some of, them are, some of them are missing L-acetylcarnitine. Uh, some of them are missing a specific enzyme, and you can replace that. The Cleveland Clinic commercially makes a compound called Carnitor, which is a pharmaceutical-grade L-acetylcarnitine. Now, um, I tried to go back through and update this data. We published this paper a, num a number of years ago because we've been working more collaboratively with Dr. Cohen. Um, and uh, as you may or not, may not know, my life has been kind of difficult. Um, but anyway, so up to date, we now are going to publish a follow-up study where we've identified at least 34 people. Uh, these are all confirmed by biopsies done by the Cleveland Clinic. Um, there were tw uh, 12 males, 22 females. The age range is 12 to 59. Um, now this also includes, now this is a skewing of a data because now the Mitochondrial Foundation sends people to us. So we have a high probability of, of you know, I mean, it's a select group of people. And one of the things you've got to realize when you look at the data from our institution is we get really the worst end stage people. And so we have a very high likelihood of finding these other things before they even walk in the door. So one of the things that we've been impressed with is the number of people, and usually these are very sick people, and they're often children. Uh, they're oftentimes uh, in wheelchairs, and actually about six of them, and I was going to show you their pictures, but I couldn't get a hold of them to get their permission. They uh, end up with tracheostomies and have to be on portable ventilators because they are unable to maintain enough inspiratory airflow to be able to keep them alive. The second group of people that we've been working with now more extensively are post-trauma patients. These are individuals that have suffered some kind of traumatic brain injury. Now, the most common is going to be an automobile accident, but I'll show you some data from the um, from uh, uh, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan in a moment. Um, and that we had a number of people that were complaining to us that their symptoms began after some kind of head trauma. They were perfectly fine and had some kind of head trauma. Now, the most common are, are uh, head traumas involving uh, motor vehicle accidents. Uh, when you smash your head into it, even if you have an airbag, while your skull may stop, your brain keeps moving and goes and then it ricochets backward and hits the back part of your skull. But at the same time, when you see this, it's called a coup counter coup injury. You'll notice in the blue part here, so your brain comes down in through a hole in the bottom called the foramen magnum. And so your brain stem, which is where a lot of your autonomic function is, is down in that same region and gets the same thing, the same exact thing. So that, um, now this has been described for a long time, in a, uh, right immediately. So there's a huge uh, published literature in the trauma literature that people in the immediate aftermath of head trauma will develop all kind of autonomic problems. Their, their blood pressures, temperatures, everything will go haywire. However, the problem is that no one ever followed up on these people. 
And it's the nature of the business because what happens is when they're dismissed from the trauma service, that's it, they're done, you're gone. You know? And there was no coherent follow-up. So initially we, we looked at a, a series of eight people who had been referred to us. Um, they all had some kind of, usually motor vehicle accidents, um, and we did a series of, of tests on them, looking at them in a little more detail. All of them had had uh, some kind of injury uh, to the head. Most of them were motor vehicle accidents. Most of them also developed a, a large amount of cognitive dysfunction and published this week in the journal Nature, um, actually a few days ago, was a uh, wonderfully done study, not only showing that people who have had head trauma get premature Alzheimer's disease or premature dementia, the protein, the amyloid, the tau protein that accumulates is identical to that seen in, in um, Alzheimer's disease. And the group that published it has developed in a mouse model a monoclonal antibody, which if administered immediately in the aftermath of the head trauma, seems to prevent this from happening. Um, now this, now the, in nature it was an animal study, it was an animal model that was there, but it's extremely promising data uh, because apparently there's an early window of opportunity you have to prevent this and if you miss that window, it's not going to help it. So we showed that, um, um, that this could be, that the people who develop these kind of problems early on after, in the immediate aftermath of a head trauma, it may continue. And again, uh, uh, Dr. Karabin and I, my, my partner and also a, one of the uh, residents and a fellow went back through f for this meeting. We've so far in the last few years seen 38 patients who developed problems, immediate, have never had a problem before their head trauma, um, and then did 26 are motor vehicle accidents, seven are post-concussive, meaning they're all veterans that have been referred to us by the military who have had, uh, were fine and then had an explosion of some sort that, that uh, uh, affected them. Uh, we're trying to enter in a collaborative thing with the Veterans Administration. Five of that miscellaneous means that there were people that fell off ladders and had work-related injuries, et cetera. So head trauma seems to be a precipitating thing and it may precipitate these inflammatory degenerative changes that we know then lead to early cognitive dysfunction and early Alzheimer's in head trauma patients. Um, we also began to see people who initially were sent to us and then had, a, as we were following them, um, as a clinician, I can say that, and actually as a farm kid who was an electrician first, I've learned to, um, trust this sort of bad feeling. And there were some people we see who I just got a bad feeling. And I got a, and I, and I cannot be more scientific than that, but a, just a bad feeling that something else was going on. They had too many other symptoms, they had too many other things. And as we followed those people long enough over long periods of time, and the other thing I think that's, that's, that's one of the problems in the field is there's not been long-term follow-up. Um, that people have followed people a year, maybe three or five years and all. In our database, and if I can ever get a chance to go through it, we have, we have followed people up to 15 years post-diagnosis. Um, so a group of these people later went on to develop multiple sclerosis. So what is multiple sclerosis? Well, there's these, your nerves have insulation on them. They're called myelin. The myelin uh, wraps around them and actually accelerates con nervous conduction, so it allows the nerves to transmit faster. One of the problems in the autonomic system, by the way, is the fibers are unmyelinated. It's, they're unmyelinated C fibers, so they don't run as fast. And in multiple sclerosis, the sheath breaks down. It's felt that this is an autoimmune disorder. So we said, could Perth POTS be the presenting sign of MS? So we looked back through our data. Uh, we, we identified a number of people that we had initially seen and followed them over long periods of time. And uh, we identified at our first data, first study, nine patients who initially were presented to us with symptoms of autonomic problems, usually syncope, near syncope, postural tachycardia syndrome, and followed them over time. And in time, even though their initial evaluations had been negative for multiple sclerosis, they later all turned positive. So we concluded from that that some people um, may, uh, their presenting sign of MS could be autonomic. Well, that makes sense because the placking effects that go, occur in the brain can be anywhere in the brain. And MS is called the great imitator. Wherever it begins, that's what you get. 
So if it begins in the visual centers, you get visual problems. If it begins in the motor centers, you get motor problems. If it begins in the emotional centers, you get emotional problems. And it can occur within the brain stem area. So we have, we have identified it, uh, in the last uh, couple of years at least six patients whose uh, POTS diagnosis preceded their MS diagnosis by anywhere from one to five years. This is an example of one who was a physician from uh, Harrisburg. Um, she came to us with syncope and near syncope, uh, but sort of a, a, a more of an orthostatic hypotension type, type pattern. Her uh, MRIs, uh, cerebral spinal fluid samples, all were normal. Uh, she had an extensive workup done uh, at, a, at her, where she came from before us. And again, she was one of these people where I just said, I got a bad feeling about this. There's something ain't right. Um, and, um, but anyway, we treated her, put her midodrine, fludrocortisone, sent her back. About a year later, her husband called and said, you know, she's really getting worse. <laughs> um, the, um, and she's, she's had to stop practicing. She's, she's stumbling around. I said, well, bring her back. And in clinic, she was obviously had, was back and having very severe orthostatic hypotension despite, therapy, despite being on the therapy. Uh, a number of her neurologic tests were normal, so we took her to back to, to the MRI scan and repeated her MRI, and um, all that white stuff you see that wasn't there a year previously is all placking throughout the brain that indicates severe multiple sclerosis. Now, I put that cut up there since it's so dramatic looking, but there's a different cut where you can see that that placking also had infiltrated the brain stem area. Um, so those are just some of the um, uh, things we've been looking at because, as I said, just like heart failure, there are multiple different ways to get to these conditions. And sometimes these clinical symptoms, things can be a sign of something else. So for example, uh, as our last speaker alluded to, amyloidosis, well, heart failure can be a presenting sign that you've got amyloidosis and you can only develop it later. So sarcoidosis also can be, you can present with heart failure or heart problems and only develop all the other stuff later. So we know that's true in, in the realm of cardiology. We know that a number of illnesses may first present with one organ involvement before they spread to other places. And that may be a while before it does that. And it turns out, I believe the autonomic system is the same way, that a number of different disease processes may first present with autonomic symptoms and later blossom out to other things. We have seen, and just as our previous speaker alluded to, we have seen people with a variety of malignancies, usually adenocarcinomas of various forms, that initially will present with severe autonomic problems and later turn up to have, have these kind of problems. We've also seen people, as I said, with sarcoidosis, uh, amyloidosis, um, people who have degenerative problems such as um, we have seen also individuals with ALS who, who or later turned out to have ALS who are referred to our clinic. But also just as an aside, we've also had people who have just been totally misdiagnosed. Um, in the last several years, we picked up several people who ended up having pheochromocytomas. People don't realize that the urinary tests they do for screening are only or will pick up 80% of the patients, 80%. Uh, we've had several people have turned out to have a condition called carcinoid syndrome. Um, so we've, we've also got ended up, and again, I think it's because of the nature of we, people we see, we've got people that have totally other illnesses and are refractory because they're treating the wrong thing um, where, where they've been sent to us. So this has been a whole new world. Um, you know, I started out life to be a surgeon. and. Um, the, um, so it's a little bit different of a world for me, but it's nonetheless been a fascinating encounter. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that some of this stuff, it's hard to, we, you know, we, we as scientists like quantified things, we like hard numbers, we like this. But a lot of this is very, very difficult, and it's very difficult to quantify in a way that actually makes sense. And so sometimes you have to run through just intuition. Um, and as Einstein said, everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. So thank you. This is, um, this is um, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, as Michelangelo said, I'm still learning. Um, however, as um, Mark Twain said, all you need in this life is ignorance and confidence, and success is assured. So thank you. Thank you.